Well, welcome to the Friday edition of Wands World. And I may, uh, in fact, you'll see in probably a second, a few flashes of a, a dish that I was going to make for today. And I'll probably do it on Tuesday for you. Uh, it's a dish from Sarawak uh, called Mi Sapi, or um, beef noodles, which is a very common breakfast dish. And I made it for myself yesterday. And uh, all right, I'll flash up a picture <laughs> and I'll give you more details on Tuesday. Today, I want to talk about a subject that I was just thinking about in the context of education, which has been on my mind quite a bit for the past few weeks. And as in my last video on uh, learning how to write, um, I've been thinking about teaching and learning. And the concept that I came across, uh, well, I've, I mean, I've known about it for some time, but I came across it again, let's say, the other day called learned helplessness. And this is a very complicated subject, but it's one that I want to contest. I want to argue that helplessness is indeed a problem, but it's not so much learned as taught <laughs> and that's the important part so let's get into that So let me start with the psychology of learned helplessness, which comes from a series of experiments that were done. I don't remember when or by whom, maybe Stanley Milgram, but I can't remember. Um, and the, the way that it worked was that a number of dogs were divided into two groups. And one group was put into a set of cages where they were given electric shocks repeatedly but there was a way that they could get out of it. I don't, again, remember what it was, whether it was pushing a button or jumping a fence or whatever, but there was some way that they could stop being shocked. And there was another group in a different cage where they're being shocked continuously and there was nothing they could do about it. They were just constantly being shocked. So not a great experiment to begin with. I mean, not tremendously humane, probably would not be allowed anymore but these were early days so anyway the, then these dogs were all put into different cage where they could escape and different mechanism I suspect from the first mechanism but there was a way that they could escape and the dogs in the first group who had learned how to escape from the shocks in the first experiment quickly learned how to escape from them in the second experiment. And the ones who had not been given the opportunity to escape the shocks didn't try to escape them. They just accepted that that's reality, that I'm getting shocked, okay, that's, that's my life. And even when they were shown how to get away from the shocks, it took on average two sh times showing them what to do before they got away. They had been, they, according to the, the, uh, like the psychologists, they had learned helplessness. And what I want to say is no, they had been taught helplessness. They had been shown that there was nothing that they could do and they accepted what they were taught by the people that in some ways they, res they respected or trusted or whatever. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about putting people in educational situations where they are constantly going to fail and you blame them. That is, you teach them that they are useless. 
And I'm going to give you an excellent, excellent example from my own experience. Going back again, as I did on Tuesday, to my years of schooling in Australia. In my first year of secondary school in Australia, we had 40 classes per week uh, divided up as, um, I guess, eight classes a day, five days a week. Um, yeah, so three, it's like, so five in the morning, so three classes, then recess, then two classes, then lunch, then three classes, and sometimes you got a, a recess and sometimes you didn't, and then you went home. So eight classes a day, uh, five days a week. And the first three classes on Monday in, in my uh, year were art. It was from, so from first bell in the morning until recess, we were in the art room doing art. And the last three classes of the week on Friday afternoon was woodwork. And woodwork included technical drawing. And it's the technical drawing aspect that I want to focus on more than the woodwork. Although the woodwork's important too, but I want to uh, focus mostly on the technical drawing. Because you've got freehand drawing for three classes at the beginning of the week and technical drawing for three classes at the end of the week. So there's two kinds of drawing. And I was left at the end of the year basically believing that I was useless at freehand drawing, but that I was okay at technical drawing. Now what was going on there? It's not that I'm useless at freehand drawing, and it's not that I'm great at technical drawing. It's how I was taught. This is the essence of the subject. It's how you get taught, not how smart or stupid or whatever you are. Now, just as a general thought, you know, how many times have you been taught by somebody, a friend or a parent or whatever, that you are useless at something? <laughs> well, you may accept their judgment. Uh, my my mother, particularly, was very, very good at teaching us how we couldn't do things because that's just us. You know, we're, we're not like that. Um, and back in the 50s and 60s, there was a general idea that if you were an intelligent person, then you were really no good with your hands. That, 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 that was kind of God's um, you know, <laughs> bad dealing of hands. You know, he either dealt you a big brain or good hands, but not both, which is just absolutely stupid and completely wrong. Uh, it's just like the modern conception that you see on something like the Big Bang Theory, that if you're smart, that you're no good at sports. Also not remotely true. Just think about Roger Bannister, the first person in the world to run a four-minute mile who when he was training for this was also a medical student and he went on to be one of the most prestigious neurosurgeons in the world. It's just ridiculous to say, you know, intelligent, therefore sports, useless. Uh, just also nonsense. Anyway, first thing on Monday morning I had to go to art and I was taught over and over and over again by my teacher that I was useless. But how did she teach us? She would go to the blackboard at first and then and just sort of draw something. Uh, like for example, I was just thinking about this the other day, um, right at the beginning of the year, uh, the Queen and uh, Prince Philip came to South Australia for a visit and we were all shipped off down to the city called Elizabeth, after her, uh, to see her ride around the, the oval track and wave our flags and all of that. Next day in art class, or whenever, like next week I guess, uh, the art teacher says, okay, draw your visit to the Queen. 
Like, how? Like, what, what am I supposed to do? I mean, like, what do I, how do I draw a crowd? I, I like, have nothing to copy. I have no instructions. Um, I, I, nothing. I, I, so I just got out my, my sheet of um, drawing paper and um, mixed up some colors and just kind of like swirled around some colors of hair <laughs> in a crowd and that was it. And, and, and her comment was something like, not free enough. <laughs> I don't know. You know, and I got, I think, five out of ten as my mark for my effort that day. And we had homework. And each week we always had homework. We had a, a blank drawing book. And typically we had to repeat the lesson of the day. So our homework, our first homework was um, to draw the royal visit again. And now I didn't have paint. I mean, in, in our homework books, we usually just used pencil, although we could use colored pencils, but I didn't have any. So I just used pencil and I just, you know, draw some arcs and, you know, just like people's heads. And I got four out of ten for that, she said. And she wrote, not as free as your drawing in class or something like that. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what sense does that make? She would always give us instructions like draw a pattern using interlocked rectangles. Well, how? I mean, like, what, what are the principles? Uh, you know, like, so some of my friends were, you know, pretty good at it and they, they spent a lot of time at it and they would make these intricate interlocking patterns and then color them and they looked really nice. And mine looked horrible. Uh, she once asked me to draw my house, or which I did, and I used a ruler uh, to, to because <laughs> you know the edges and the brickwork and so forth are all straight, and I thought I did a really nice job. Four out of ten in red ink. Don't use a ruler. Uh, okay, could you have like told me that beforehand? So by the end of the year. I was pretty much convinced that I was terrible at freehand drawing. But here's the thing, on Friday afternoons we had woodwork. And the woodwork teacher uh, also instructed technical drawing, which um, um, I don't think is taught very much anymore because um, computer-aided drafting uh, takes its place. Um, but back then, uh, drawing schematics um, architectural drawings, um, engineering drawings and so forth, all had to be done by hand. And uh, it's, it's complicated um, and technical. <laughs> and so from day one, we were sat down at our desks with ruler and um, uh, set square and compass, and he taught us the rules. Like, this is how you do a plan, this is how you do an elevation, this is how you do an end elevation, this is how you put the uh, dimensions from one to the other, and so on. And he, and he showed us very specifically how to do it. And he then used that technique to design things that we then went into the woodwork shop and built. But it was all done according to very strict instructions. Now I'm not going to say I was any good at it um, when I was 11 years old. I wasn't. But I, I, but I wasn't half bad. I mean I was okay. Uh, in fact, I went on to take uh, the O-level uh, technical drawing um, in England and my first job in England was teaching technical drawing for my first year of teaching because I had become good enough at it to be able to do it very well. And I also published a book with my wife, and I'm going to show you some illustrations here, that are all my technical drawing. If you're given instructions, proper instructions, step-by-step, -step, careful instructions, which you then follow, and if you have <laughs> any kind of imagination, you can turn it around into something 
that is useful, like in this case, drawings of quilts, which I did on a drafting table with a set square and ruler and compass and what have you. And I ended up in one summer drawing 450 illustrations for this book. Here's the really neat part. I also did freehand drawings for the book. And I'll try to include some in here. I mean, they're not great, but they'll, they'll give you an idea. Because I had the confidence through technical drawing to understand things like perspective, dimension, and so forth. And I was able to experiment. And what I needed to do was to take out a you know, spare drawing pad and just keep working at it. Okay, so I'm, I, need, I need to show an illustration of um, uh, whip stitch. Okay, how do I draw a needle? How do I draw a thread? How do I draw fabric? Just work it out. If you look at the drawing books of some of the most famous artists in the world, like um, Vincent von Hoch, look at, his, look at the number of times he drew hands or drew noses or ears or just like over and over and over and over. So it's not like you're useless at drawing or you're useless at cooking or useless at um, sewing or whatever. You start off being useless because you're useless at everything and you learn how to do certain things if you keep practicing. That's what I was saying last time about writing. You don't start off by saying I'm a useless writer. I don't know how to write. Um, as if it's genetic. It's not genetic at all. It's, it's what you teach yourself. But you have to start from the most significant principle, which is I can do this. <laughs> I mean, I can't do it now. Um, and there's some things that like now I, I can't, I'll never be able to do. Um, I'm not going to be able to run a mile in four minutes. I never could. Um, I, I might have been able to if I had really, really, really worked at it because I could run 400 meters. That's once around a track or f 440 yards. Let's do it in imperial units. I could go around to 440 yards in about 58 seconds. You've only got to do that four times and you've done a mile. <laughs> and 58 times four is under four minutes. Well, you know, it's kind of hard to keep up that pace. But if I had trained well and I had eaten properly and I'd, I'd had a good coach and all of that kind of thing, I might have been able to do it. Can't do it now. Can't do it because I'm old. I don't have the cardiopulmonary system for it anymore. I don't have the musculature for it anymore. But there's a lot of things I can still do. I can still climb um, the foothills of the Himalayas, or at least I could three years ago. Um, you know, I can climb huge steps um, up the top of temples in Nepal, uh, in um, low um, uh, atmospheric conditions because of the altitude. And I, I can do a lot of things. Um, if I put my mind to it and, and, and if I don't let my limitations that I've imposed upon myself stop me. So there are some cases in which I put the limitations on myself, but most of the time when I was growing up, and this is the important thing, most of the time when I was growing up, the limitations were imposed on me by my parents and by my teachers. They told me, oh, you're very good at this. Oh, you're no good at this. You know, like my mother told me, I could, you know, I can't ride a bicycle. Like, uh, you know, like we don't, we don't ride bicycles. Right? It took me until I was 14 years old and I just rebelled. Up until that point, they wouldn't buy me a bicycle. They wouldn't teach me how to ride a bicycle, even though my father knew how to ride a bicycle. He was perfectly good at it, but he, he, never, he never interfered with my mother's admonitions and my mother couldn't ride a bicycle. My sisters can't ride bicycles to this day. 
although one of my sisters rides a standing bicycle for, um, for exercise. But at the age of 14, I was living in England with my parents, but we had to be separated for a while, and I had to stay with an old school friend from before we went to Australia. Um, he and I were best buddies in infant school, that is the ages of six, five and six. And, and then we, we left and went to Australia and I came back at the age of 14 and I stayed with him and his father and mother. And, and he had this big plan, you know, because he thought, ah, it's my buddy, we'll go out on long bicycle rides. And I said, I can't ride a bicycle. And he just said, well, learn. <laughs> you know, and he, had a, he took me out and, you know, like took me an hour or so to fiddle around with it. And I learned how to ride a bicycle. And I've ridden a bicycle ever since. You know, it's just, it's a matter of what other people impose upon you and you're too weak-willed to uh, go against. So there's my really deep, deep lesson for the day, is, to, is it's not learned helplessness, it's imposed helplessness that you accept and you should stop doing that. So when, like, fill in the blank here. I'm no good at, okay, genetically, I mean, why not? Or, or did you try and fail? How many times did you try and fail? And did you have anyone who was helping you learn how to do it? I mean, that's the thing about cooking. I mean, I've known tons of people, um, particularly women. I mean, I've got a lot of men friends who say, I don't know how to cook. Well, that's, that's laziness. <laughs> you know, they're relying on their wives or their girlfriends to cook for them. But I know a lot of women who can't cook. Um, and I mean, they're really t terrible, but, but no one's ever taught them proper method. If you, if you, get, if you get shown, like I can, I can show you how to make a rice dish or um, spaghetti or pasta or uh, cellophane noodles or whatever. I mean, I've done it <laughs> enough times here. I can keep doing it with you personally in the kitchen with me. And I can say, okay, now we need to crack the eggs. Okay, now you need to do this. Now you need to do that. And, and just stay with them, not just one time, but twice, three times, four, as many times as it takes for them to have confidence that they can do it and take it from there. It's not learned helplessness. It's imposed or accepted helplessness put on you from others. Don't let that happen. And meanwhile, please like and subscribe. Have a good weekend. Do something that you don't know how to do. And I'll come back on Tuesday and I'll check in with you. Take care.